All right, hello, Valley Creek. It is good to see you today. I want to take a moment and welcome in all of our campuses, whether you're joining us in Denton Venue, Louisville, Flower Mound, online, or at an extension site. Let's welcome each other together today. Man, it is good to be together, and it is good to have celebrated the 4th of July. I hope you had a great time with your family. Sometimes it's good to just be, and sometimes it's good to breathe. Sometimes it's good not to blow your fingers off with fireworks. So I hope you did all of those things during the holiday. I hope you had an amazing time with your family. Every single time we celebrate one of our national holidays, it's a chance to remember the people who have sacrificed that we would live in freedom. I am thankful for them. I know you are thankful for them. And it's also a reminder that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, that we could live in freedom. So I hope your holiday was awesome. We are back together for the second week of the One Another series. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the One Another passages in the Bible. And we're going to be letting them serve as a roadmap to relationships. You see, One Another passages are simply just practical ways to engage the relationships in our life. When we look at all of the One Another's in scriptures, it's the way for the scripture to show us what, the, what to do in relationships, how to walk those out with the people that we love, the people that we're closest to. So as we've been thinking about those one another's, love one another, honor one another, serve one another, there's one that seemed so critical, so important as we were praying through them that we wanted to talk about it today. It's one that's like water in the desert. It's like breath in your lungs. It is encouragement. And let's be honest, how many of us could use some encouragement? I know this guy could. Raise your hand if you could use some encouragement. Doesn't it seem like negativity is the language of the day? It's almost like you should wake up every day and expect to be discouraged. Like hit your alarm clock, like here we go, wake up. Okay, here's another day of discouragement. You wake up out of bed, you go and you make your lunches for your kids. Oh, I don't like that sandwich, mom. You go to school, you go to school you know, they send them off and they're unhappy with their food. You go to work, the boss is like, hey man, where's that TPS report? I thought you were going to get it to me last week. Okay, I didn't get a chance to do it. You go on to your coworkers and they say, hey, did you get a new haircut? Why, yes, I did. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh. You listen to the news, you listen to the radio, it's all crazy. Stocks are all falling, the same, you know, politics is the same as it ever was. You got to call your bank to get your password reset on online banking. How many people are used to the discouragement on that one? You call your bank, and it's almost like the person on the other end of the customer service line should say, thank you for calling Wells Fargo. I hate my life, and I'm about to tell you that over the course of this phone call. And then you never actually do get to a real person. You just kind of walk through the, you know, the phone tree. And then to finish things out, you find out that your license has to be renewed. you got to finish the day at the DMV. It's almost like you should expect to be discouraged every day of your life. And I believe that we're not the only ones that feel that way. In fact, I know that the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he felt very similar Man, he was surrounded with people trying to kill him all the time, trying to persecute him, trying to just uh, mock him. And so he faced a lot of challenges. In fact, take a look at what Paul says here. Right at the uh, 2 Corinthians 7, right at the beginning of, of talking to the people in Corinthians, he says, hey, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. That's kind of like the people that are like, we just went on vacation, but we need a vacation from our vacation. It looks like that conflict from every direction, battles on the outside, and fear on the inside. That's a little bit like life, isn't it? Battles out here, fear in here. A lot of us face that on a daily basis. And a lot of us have family members, people that we love that face the exact same thing. In fact, think about that for a second. The people you love the most, the people you're closest to, they are constantly facing battles out here and fears in here. So what should we do about it? What can be done about it? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 gives us the insight. Therefore, what's the therefore? It's because of all the negativity, all the discouragement, all of the things that we face in life. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. You see, we're called to build each other up, to be able to fight the battles, to face the fears. You see, encouragement builds up. When the world wants to tear you down, when the world wants to put fear inside of you, Encouragement is how we build one another up. And hear me, encouragement is the language of a hope carrier. If you're a hope carrier, if you carry the hope of Jesus inside of you, encouragement is the way that you speak hope into people's lives. It's the language of a hope carrier. So the question is, 
do you speak the language? Do you speak the language of a hope carrier? Not only to the people that you go to the grocery store and you see out there and the lady at the checkout counter, the waitress, do you speak it to those you're closest to? To the ones that you spend the most amount of time with to help them face the fears, to fight the battles? You see, encouragement is very simple to think about. It just means to put courage into. When I'm encouraging someone, I'm putting courage into them. So when we encourage one another, we are placing the courage, the hope of heaven into that person to face the fears, to fight the battles. Proverbs 12, 18 says, the word of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So catch this, most of the people that you're around on a daily basis, their scars aren't on the outside. Their wounds, their scars, they're invisible. They're on the inside. And so your words, your healing words can begin to heal those wounds, can begin to bind up the scars of the people that you love the most. And that's what encouragement can do. And words can go two very different directions. You see, every word you speak can build up or it can tear down. Every word you speak can poke a hole or it can patch it. Every word you speak can bring life or it will bring death. And the world is desperate to hear the words of hope that only we can speak. Hear me. Your family is desperate to hear the words of hope that only you can speak, the encouragement that you can give. Your coworkers, your friends, your kids, your spouse, people in your life are desperate for the encouragement that only you can speak. Students, your friends are desperate for the encouragement that only you can speak. Parents, your kids are desperate for the encouragement that only you can speak. Spouses, your spouse is desperate for the encouragement that only you can speak. Church, the people in our church family, the people we gather with every single weekend, they are desperate for the words of encouragement that only you can speak. When we gather together, It's a chance to encourage and to be encouraged by one another. That's part of why something like Tuesday night on campus groups is so important. It's a chance to know and be known. It's a chance to encourage and receive encouragement. There's one major problem with giving encouragement. It's really hard to be encouraged if nobody knows you enough to know where to encourage you or how to encourage you or what to encourage you on. So I encourage all of us to engage in life here inside the Valley Creek family so that You can be encouraged and you can be an encourager. Encouragement is the language of a hope carrier. So that's what I want to have a conversation about. Today, I want to have a conversation and give you four practical ways that you can begin to encourage those that you love, those that you are closest to and spend the most amount of life with. Are we okay with that? All right, here we go. First way you can encourage those you love is encourage specifically. Earlier this spring, I got a note of encouragement. I was so specific, it, had, uh, it, had so, it was so detailed, it was about a page long, that it almost took my breath away, man. It meant so much to get the encouragement that he wanted to speak to me. I, I actually kept it on my desk because I was so encouraged by that note. It came at a good time, it was a busy season. I, I just was really, really thankful to have it. On the contrary, my friend got a Father's Day card and it read, hey dad, you're my dad. That's... That's not quite what we're talking about. That wasn't quite specific enough. See, when you give encouragement, try really hard to be specific, okay? So what you gotta do is you gotta think about what I see in you. Even the letters, I see in you. What do I see in you? That's what encouragement is. You see, not just, hey, good job, but hey, great job. When you played third base, all the people in the infield, they knew what they were supposed to be doing. You took charge, you were leading them. That was awesome, man. You gotta actually add to the encouragement, why? Because specific encouragement shows that you care specifically. It shows that you care about that person specifically. It shows them that you're paying attention and calling attention to the good that you see in them. Paul would constantly encourage the churches when he'd write them a letter. And and what he would do is he would get very specific in what he saw in them. So not just, hey guys, thanks for the gift. But hey, thanks for that generous gift. You gave way beyond your means, way beyond what you had available. Thank you for that. Or check this out, what he says this in in, uh, 1 Corinthians. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. So how have they been enriched? In these ways. So he specifically lays out for them what he sees in them. That is specific encouragement. 
Because of that, he calls out and explains what he sees and the way they speak and the knowledge they have, and he encourages those churches. He, he raises their faith level. So, no more, good job, buddy. You're great. <laughs> what was good? Why were they great? What did you like about it? That is specific. Guess what? Moms, dads, coworkers, it takes more time and it takes more effort to do that. Because specific encouragement shows that you care specifically. So we got to encourage specifically. You see, the world uses words like a machine gun. Kind of say it and spray it. You know that's true. You see that all over the place. But that's not necessarily helpful, and sometimes it's really dangerous. And so the kingdom uses words like a heart surgeon, specific, strategic, the hard work of healing wounded hearts. That's what we're talking about. So that's the first one, encourage specifically. Next one is this, encourage intentionally. You gotta encourage intentionally because James 3, 6 says, the tongue is a fire. The tongue's like a fire. The only question is, what kind of fire are you burning? Are you, are you lighting fires that are gonna burn them down or light them up? You see, think about the way the fires work. Like if you were to think about a, a forest fire, a forest fire is probably unintentional, it's probably, it wasn't even planned, it's probably, it's really dangerous, it's destructive, but a fire on a cold winter's night is thoughtful, it's planned out, it brings light and warmth and comfort to everybody who's in the room. So a fire can work two very different ways. And the same is true with our words, because the tongue is like a fire. You want to speak words that ignite fires of life into the people that you love. Husbands, you know this is something you could do. You could speak intentional encouragement because sometimes you're forced to do it. When your wife comes in with that new outfit and she says, honey, does this dress make me look? And time slows down. <laughs> and adrenaline starts to rush through your veins. Sweat collects on your brow. In that moment, you're the most intentional encourager in the world. You're very thoughtful about what you're going to say next. Even check this out in 1 Thessalonians 5. Be skilled at gently encouraging those who then themselves feel inadequate. That's an amazing verse. You want to hold that one close to your heart. Because what it's saying is you got to be intentional. Be skilled. And when people are feeling discouraged, use skilled, uh, intentional words to encourage them. Now, the way to do that is to think about who, when, and how you need to encourage. So it's really important to understand, if you're going to be intentional about encouragement, you've got to think about the who and the when and the how. Let me give you some examples on that. So who, when, how. For the who, many times the person who is the complainer is the person that needs encouragement. So many, many times the person that's walking around with like a rain cloud over their head, that's the perfect person to speak some encouraging words to. And here's what you can do. You can seal up complaining lips with encouraging words. You can fill up an empty heart with encouraging words. So be thoughtful about who you're encouraging. Be thoughtful about when you're encouraging. Uh, did they just get cut from the team? Did they just miss that promotion? Did they just uh, you know, miss a chance to be part of the theater production? Maybe that's a time to speak encouragement. Or maybe not. Maybe that's not the right time to try to speak encouragement. Maybe it would sound trite and it wouldn't work then. So you gotta be thoughtful on when. And you got to be thoughtful on how you encourage. So catch this. Many times our encouragement is based on performance statements rather than identity statements. Now think about why that's a problem. If every time you get encouraged, it was because of something you did, what happens next time you don't make the quota, you don't make the team, you don't do it that way? What happens then? Who are you then? What's your worth then? So you have to think about encouragement based on identity statements, who the person is, who they're becoming, who God says that they are. My wife Carrie and I have tried to really think about this with our daughters. With our two daughters, one is uh, Anna. She's 13 years old, and she's creative, and she does art, and she just loves that. And my, my other daughter's uh, Naomi. She's eight years old, and she's energetic, and she's fun. So with each one of them, we try to think about how to encourage them towards identity rather than performance. So with Anna, if she comes in with a project, um, it, you know, we want to say, like, oh, that's so great, and we will. We'll say, like, that looks great. That's awesome. Anna, you're so creative. You reflect the creativity of God. We love that about you. Naomi comes in. Oh, Naomi's funny. She's funny. Makes jokes. Naomi, that's such a funny joke. Naomi, you're so joyful. 
You have the joy of heaven that just flows through you. We love that about you. We try the best that we can to try to call those out so that we're doing encouragement based on identity, not just on behavior. That's really, really important. Who they are, not just what they do. So uh, uh, how you do it, when you do it, uh, to who you, you do it, that sounds like a lot, but just catch this. When you're encouraging, just let, like, let love fill your heart. Just think about the person. Just flow from a deep place of just love for that person, and you'll get it right. You, you may not know exactly how to do it. We just have to start encouraging, start letting our words be spoken out. Also, we got to remember that encouragement against something is not the same as encouragement towards something. So see if you can catch this. Encouragement against something is not the same as encouragement towards something. It's crazy. We'll say, I just want to encourage you on something. Oh, boy. Here it comes. That shirt does not look good on you. Okay, well, thank you. That's, um, that's not encouragement. That's constructive criticism. Maybe destructive criticism. It's not encouragement, though. That's not actually encouragement. And yet we do that all the time. Can I just encourage you on something? Uh, now that you've hit 40, you're going to need to work out a lot more. Okay, well... Um, that's not encouraging, but thank you for the advice on that. So why? Because we don't need more reminding of who we're not or what won't happen. We need more reminding on who God says that we are, who he declares that we are, and his dreams for our life. That's why. And the craziest thing is, a lot of times the tone of our encouragement even reflects a scarcity mindset. We'll say, I just want to encourage you towards something. And then we'll have a critical spirit or a controlling spirit in it. And so we'll actually do more damage than more good. Think about it. We say things like, you better hurry up. You're going to run out of time. You better get that job. Better have that baby. Better lose that weight. It's our criticism that's often hidden under the guise of encouragement. And I use air quotes cautiously because it's not encouragement. It's control. It's critical. And it does not help. It's words that are burning down, not lighting up somebody's heart. So encourage specifically encourage intentionally. Why? Because we are hope carriers. So we carry the hope of Jesus inside of us. So we speak the hope of Jesus into those around us. So those are the first two. Specifically, intentionally, check this one out. Encourage supernaturally. Hear me. There are things that God wants to speak to them from him through you. There are words of life that God wants to speak into those that you love, those that you spend the most time with, that are words from heaven that can light up their heart. It can change everything. So you got to speak supernaturally. you got to pull down and listen for when God wants to speak into their life. I heard heard an amazing story from my friend Chris, who's in my, uh, my men's group. Chris has a daughter named Brooklyn. And Brooklyn's faced more medical problems than most of us will face in a lifetime. She was born in a, with a hole in her heart. It's just been a really tough road for her so far. And so they've been, uh, they've been uh, showing their, their journey on social media. People have been following them, kind of walking and encouraging them. And one day, he had a sense that he was supposed to send out a message to just say, okay, we're not going to give up hope, so you don't need to give up hope either. He just had this sense. He called it like a, like a deep feeling. Of course, it's, it's supernatural, like it was the spirit trying to speak to him. So we're not going to give up hope. You don't have to give up hope either. A guy's watching this on social media from 2,000 miles away in California. Now, what Chris didn't know is this guy had made the decision that he was going to give up on life. Literally. He was going to end his life. So his phone dings. He looks at the notification. He watches the supernatural encouragement that Chris gives. And he decides that there's more to live for. From 2,000 miles away, Chris's supernatural encouragement, we're not going to give up, you don't have to give up either, transformed everything for this guy. He was sitting in his truck, he was contemplating the future, contemplating what he was going to do, ding, and there it was. That was from heaven, to him, from him, through Chris. And the same is true for us. We can speak the words of life that can change everything in the lives of those. You see, it has a ripple effect. Because it's not just that they might want to give up on life. Like the people in your life, it may not be that drastic, but it might be drastic like they want to give up on that relationship, our church, their finances. So the people in your life are waiting for your supernatural encouragement. And you see, biblical encouragement is not scary, it's not hard, and it's actually something you may not realize is biblical encouragement is actually a form of prophecy. 
Now, when I say that word, don't get all freaked out, man. It's not freaky. Prophecy is just hearing from God and speaking from people. But check this out. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So when you encourage, it's actually a form of prophecy. Why? Because you're speaking things to a heart that may not actually believe it or think that it's true, but you're speaking the things that are not as though they are, which is the thing that God does. He speaks the things that are not yet true in our hearts as though they are and calls the best out of us. So the same is true for us. When we speak supernaturally, we're prophesying to them. We're speaking the things of heaven into a heart that may struggle to believe it. So next time you have that sense in your heart that you should encourage somebody, do it. It's not just your gut. It's the Holy Spirit. Next time you think you should call them, call them. Next time you think you should text them, Text them. Next thing you think, you should try to AOL them. AOL them. No, I'm just kidding. That doesn't exist anymore. But next time, do it. Do that because it's the Holy Spirit speaking on their behalf. And he wants to encourage them supernaturally to them, from him, through you. So make sure that when you do that, it strengthens, encourages, comforts. That's what it is to be supernatural. Okay. One encouraging word can heal in a way that thousands of positive thoughts cannot. Hey, I'm just sending positive thoughts. I don't even know what that means. Don't send positive thoughts. Speak an encouraging word or actually pray for them. Because one encouraging word can heal in a way a thousand positive thoughts cannot. Start speaking supernatural, Jesus-inspired, hope-filled, encouraging words. So here's the first three then. Encourage specifically, intentionally, supernaturally. That's a lot of lees. So here we go. Here's the fourth one. Encourage often. Encourage often. Just keep on encouraging. Keep on speaking. Look at this in Acts chapter 15. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Many words. So just keep on speaking. The people in your life will let you know when you've encouraged them too much. Oh no, please, no more. You've encouraged me too much now. No, they'll let you. It's okay. Just you keep on speaking and they'll let you know when it's like, okay, it's a little much now. Just keep on speaking many words. Why? Because encouragement is the fertilizer of our hearts. It literally fertilizes us. It helps us grow strong. It helps us stand taller. It helps us get more confident. You want to see those in your life grow stronger, stand with more confidence, live free and stay healthy? you got to fertilize them with your words. Parents, begin to fertilize your children with your encouraging words and watch them live out their God-given potential and purpose. Coworkers. Encourage the office and watch the atmosphere shift from somber to successful. Spouses, encourage your spouse. Watch them begin to respond with more openness and more kindness. Spread this fertilizer of encouragement often because that's how you grow lives. It's how you grow hearts. It's how you heal wounds. Often many words in their hearts. By the way, something we get wrong sometimes is the opposite of encouragement is not discouragement. It's things like sarcasm, criticism, silence. Maybe when we don't say anything at all, that is the opposite of encouragement. So use encouragement as a fertilizer instead. In fact, I challenge all of us. Just say one encouraging thing per day. You can spread it out to different people. One encouraging thing per day and actually make that like a goal, a mental goal in your life to encourage the one another's in your life one time per day. Maybe even before you leave campus, as you're having a popsicle, as you're hanging out with our crew here, maybe you just say, I'm going to encourage somebody here. Somebody that, you know, maybe made me that latte or took care, took care of my kids and loved on them during service. And use your words of encouragement and let many words of encouragement come out of you. One per day. I challenge all of us to just start there. It's, sometimes it's a lot easier to start with the random person out in public. I know it sounds weird. You're like, I'm going to talk to strangers in public. Yeah, but we do. We'll, like, we'll encourage that waitress or that checkout counter or whatever. That's fine, but that's not the same as encouraging those that you're closest to. That's a lot harder because they know you a lot more and you know them a lot more and you guys fight a lot more often. So that's why the words of encouragement are the ones we want to start with those that we're closest to. All right, let me finish with this. We started by talking about Paul's words in the beginning, right? That he was fighting the battles out there and he had the fears. So check out what the second verse is right after that. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us, conflict from every direction, battles on the outside, fears on the inside. But God who encourages those who are discouraged, encourage us by the arrival of Titus. Encouraged us by. So what this next verse from where we started says 
is the way that God encourages people that are facing those fears and fighting those battles on the outside is that he encourages them by you. You are the link. We are the link to love those people in our life. The people in your life, the people you love are constantly facing the battles on the outside, the fears on the inside, and he uses you to encourage them. God sends people. God sends you. God sends you to people. To them, from him, through you. That's the way that he encourages. That's the way that he speaks to our heart. We know that the people in our lives are desperate for the encouragement to fight the battles, to face the fears. So we must encourage one another. We are God's game plan for each other. We are the one another's for each other. Just like Jesus was God's game plan to encourage us. You see, Hebrews tells us that God has spoken to us in these last days through Jesus. Jesus literally carried hope from the words of the Father to a hurting and broken world. In fact, Jesus, he actually encourages us in all the ways we just talked about. See, God encourages us through Jesus, specifically, intentionally, supernaturally, and often. Think about it. God encourages us through Jesus super, uh, specifically. He chose to send Jesus. When the time had fully come, God chose Jesus, born of, one, uh, of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, us. So he, spent, he sent him at a very specific time. He sent him intentionally to us. He made a game plan from the beginning of creation, since before the beginning of creation, to come and, and bring him to us to encourage our hearts through Jesus. Supernaturally, God's super met our natural. That is the person of Jesus. He encourages us supernaturally and often. Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. He's always speaking to the Father on our behalf, using encouraging words to build us up, to place courage into us. Get it? Your Father in heaven speaks the language of a hope carrier. Your Father in heaven speaks Jesus into your life. He is the spoken word. He spoke to you specifically, intentionally, supernaturally, and he's always with you often. You know how sometimes you get about halfway through the summer and you're like, all right, summer is going to never end. When does school start again? What if it didn't have to feel like that? Like, what if this could be the summer of encouragement? Parents, what if your kids were so filled with your encouraging words that by the time summer was over, they went into school, they had more confidence, shoulders were a little taller, they stood up knowing all the different life-giving, encouraging words that you spoke to them throughout the summer. Coworkers, what if instead of like the summer doldrums and I'm sad that my vacation's over and I can't believe the office feels like this, you started speaking these encouraging words, these words of life into your coworkers. Students and friends, what if your friends, before they, they faced the semester, they were so built up with your encouraging words that they had the confidence to face whatever was in front of them. And then spouses, husbands to wives, wives to husbands. What if your spouse could face this next season of their life so encouraged, ready to face the fears, to fight the battles because you spoke so much life into them. This could be the summer of encouragement. And hear me, the people in your life are desperate for the words that only you can speak. Encouragement is the language of a hope carrier. The only question is, do you speak that language? All right, let's pray. So Jesus, thanks for this season in the Valley Creek family. It is an encouraging season. It is a great season to get to know and to be known and to speak the very words of life. We are a life-giving church. And so we are filled with the hope and the life of heaven. Right now, I pray for everybody that is hearing this, that we would be so much more confident to just begin to speak encouragement that we would receive encouragement from you and we would speak encouragement to them. That we would open our mouths, that we would open our hearts and we begin to let you flow through us into the lives of those around us. The families would begin to just speak to each other in completely different ways because we would know that we have the hope of heaven, that we're hope carriers and we'd actually carry hope to each other. 
that we change the course of our, of our families and generations of our families through encouraging words, that we would be the light in the office, that we would be the hope in the hallways at school, that we would be the ones that speak the exact encouragement that you have spoken to us through Jesus, that we would be the ones that can have the kind of confidence to say, hey, I don't exactly know what I'm gonna say, but I know it's gonna be good, and I know that God's gonna give me the words, and I know that if I'm specific and intentional and I just lean into the supernatural and then I just say it, that something can break through in an amazing way. We believe that by faith. We believe that there are breakthroughs in the hearts of people inside of this family that you want to speak uh, to them from you through us. And so I declare that for our church family. We would open our mouths and we would speak the words of life. Not because we've figured it out, but because we're being used through your words, your loving words to the children that you love through us. God, give us more confidence to speak up, to be bold, to push away the negativity, to face the fears, to fight the battles, and to speak hope. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.